Welcome back to The Tech Between Us. Today, we're wrapping up our conversation on a software-defined vehicle. Christian Uber, Chief Technology Officer of ETAS, is with us again to explore the need for stronger hardware and software co-design to enable freedom on the software layer. To catch up on our previous episodes, visit mauser.com slash empowering dash innovation. So Christian, as we move to a zonal architecture, how is that going to change current software engineering processes? For example, the way code is written, tested, or even frequency of updates. We have been integrating all the stuff we do, microcontroller, in large execution tables where we say, you run every 20 milliseconds, you run every 100 milliseconds, you run every 10 milliseconds, and so on. Everything the function did had to be integrated into these kind of tightly packed schedules. Right. And if you do that, you become naturally really coupled to your actual hardware. Introduce actually all the hardware abstraction layers you want. If you tightly pack a lot of functions in this kind of integration pattern onto a microcontroller and then you utilize it by like 97%, <laughs> anything you change is going to be highly dependent on that piece of hardware. If you want to simulate it, the simulation needs to be exactly like that hardware as it's worthless and so on. And as long as we write functions like that, it's really hard to evolve the system in a stable way. It will be closely coupled to the, the cycles of your hardware. Right. And there are some tricks you can do to get less reliant on that. And one is that you try to write functions that are less dependent on actual physical time. You write functions that are mostly depending on the data as the input part of a function. So you say the same data in, you always produce the same result. And then you make more complex functional chains of that. And if you can assure that the same data in always produces the same data out, no matter how the timing is, how it jitters, all you need to do is find a fast enough hardware where you deploy this uh, functional chain and usually it's going to run well. And this requires a change of how we write our functions. From a function developer, a large part of their work has been a mental model of, hey, I'm living in this time slice. It's 10 seconds long, already eight seconds. And after seven to eight milliseconds, you start asking your runtime, how much time do I have left? How much time do I have left? Okay. And depending on the answer, you do additional stuff before your time slice is over. And if you write your function like that, it becomes super dependent on the actual micro timing of that hardware and you right. can never move anywhere else. And if you take just this function call away from developers, you say, you cannot, you must not ask the runtime how much time you have left. That's not even the concept of physical time that you can base your calculation on. All you have is a mailbox. If I have new data for you, I will put it there. You get an activation, then you run, you make mm -hmm. a transformation on that data, then you put it in your outbox. This is all you see from the world. You see the input data, and if you're finished calculating, you can put it in your outbox. And you will also, you forget everything you knew before. <laughs> if I call you again, there's nothing left. So, and if this is not okay for you, you have to put even the stuff that you want to memorize in your outbox so that I can give it back to you in your inbox when I call you again. Uh -huh. And this is a change of a mental model for a lot of function developers, which come from traditional embedded development but it gives you tremendous benefits in how you can scale the development of that system. Because if you imagine you have such a system and you build a virtual test in the cloud, uh -huh. all this is dependent on is actual data. There is no dependencies to actual timing and so on. You can run this function anywhere. It will always produce the same result. And if you give that back to developers that you say, hey, everything you do, you get very fast, high quality feedback. If this code that you just submitted is still working correctly, functionally correct, no regressions, better or worse than the last iteration, it makes it much easier for developers to collaborate with each other. And so this is a kind of development paradigm that is changing. And so sum it up. So the key is not abstraction layers. The key is reduction of dependencies of the functions that we write. Right. We try to really make them only data dependent, and then we gain a lot of flexibility in the long run. But like you said, that's going to require a complete paradigm thought shift on the way especially that lower level microcontroller code is written yes. because you're removing any of the time dependencies. You're just saying you've got a Gazinsis and you've got a, a Gazautsis yes. and what you do with it in between is up to you. 
Yes, so a lot of the metal model changes a lot. Also, sometimes development executives believe you pay your developers for function development. In the embedded space, this is only a fraction of what they do. Right. Of course, they need to communicate a lot. There's a lot of finding out what actually works, but a, a big part in embedded development is actually make it run together with all the stuff your colleagues have created in a very tight package together. Integration, downsizing, making it stable, not oscillate and, and so on. And this is a lot of the work and this is really all based on physical timing and how they interact with each other based on physical time. If you take this out and say, oh, all you see from the outside world and all you need to care about is the data in your inbox and an efficient transformation to your outbox, this is a big constraint, but also opens a lot of new freedoms, especially the developers who follow the newest C++ standards and so on with pure functions and new memory semantics and so on, they actually can relate to that really well. They really like to try out these kind of patterns and try to write functions like that. Right. Now, some of these new microcontrollers coming out, they're still essentially control level cores. For example, the new Cortex M85 from ARM. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I mean, it has some amazing capabilities. Can microcontroller developers and function developers simply bludgeon it with just pure CPU cycles and pure compute power at that same lower level and achieve what they need to do? Well, I think there's certainly space for that. So you cannot write all of your system in the data-dependent way. This is a good fit for a subset of the overall problem to solve. Right. And I think there's certainly a case to just continue applying the expertise we have developed in the microcontroller space just to bigger farms of microcontroller cores where we just continue what we have been doing so far maybe with additional benefits of maybe hypervisors where we can more easily partition how we utilize the system, but overall continue in a very classical way of microcontroller style programming. I think mm -hmm. there's certainly a lot of room for that. Vehicle dynamics, for example, is still far away from the end of the road of doing like really high precision maneuvers, what you can do with each wheel to make really amazing, be like glued to the streets. There's still a lot of super real-time latency critical stuff that we haven't tapped into. And if we want to tap into it in a safe way, we need microcontroller style programming. Okay, so let's go ahead and shift a little bit. We've already talked a little bit about it. Kind of, once again, that shift from the pure lower level microcontroller, traditional ECU type of space to a higher level compute platform. You talked already about the difficulty in migrating that code. You talked about some of the potential changes in that the microcontroller engineer no longer gets a specific time slice. They kind of have to work in a larger box. What other types of changes are going to be required. You briefly touched on being able to test using cloud-based testing, going yes. to a higher level. What other types of changes are going to be required to be able to effectively test these new platforms to maintain those safety-critical functions? Yes, you raise a super important point. We want to become higher performing software delivery organizations, which create working in increments and a much higher frequency. Uh, this is impossible without high quality testing, which is usually to a large extent automated. It needs to run in the cloud where you have a lot of cheap, dynamic compute resources to do these tests. And there's also a pattern in automotive projects like 20 years we do retrospectives after a task force. And every time we conclude we should have invested earlier into virtual testing. Either the hardware is always available too late, so the real hardware that you can do the, the actual testing on, or the high quality simulators, they also come too late. And I think there is some improvement nowadays, so we get earlier availability of virtual hardware. But in those cases, it's still very compute intensive and you cannot, like with every small increment your developers do, pay like 60 times real time uh, compute resources for a short test cycle and so on. Right. But this is where we can actually learn a lot from the IT industry. To have like a test pyramid where you have the real hardware on the top and you have the virtual uh, hardware below and then you have different types of tests, especially also for the data deterministic execution that we talked about. So you can do a lot of things much lower in the pyramid to provide very fast test feedback to your developers who collaborate in a cloud-based environment. So. The cloud is a really great place to have hundreds of developers collaborating with each other. Right. And 
to actually do embedded development in the cloud, you offer your, to your developers representative test behavior. Mm -hmm. Because as we talked about, the function development is only a, a tiny fraction and a lot of development time is spent on fitting a lot of function to this tight space. Right. And if your virtual target in the cloud has a different behavior than the stuff on your desk, people will continue to work on their desk. This will not be highly collaborative. This will not be incremental. This will be just the old model. And so offering high quality tests on smart test solutions for fast feedback in cloud-based environments, this is really critical going forward and also a portfolio topics that we invest heavily into. Okay. Now, in testing, what we've always used at the lower level embedded worlds, every MCU, every whatever has a dev kit. And I guess there's really no such thing as a dev kit for a Mercedes. So you're right. You do have to have these virtualized systems that accurately mimic the actual operation of the system. Yes. Hence, it's worthless. You guys are not going to use it. They just continue with a dev kit on their desk. Right. Exactly. Before we get to the second half of this episode, let's highlight a particular use case for zonal architecture. In software-defined vehicles, how will the flexibility and scalability of zonal architecture enable vehicles to adapt to changing needs while increasing safety, efficiency, and personalization? To explore this use case and other exclusive content, visit mousery.com slash empowering dash innovation. You also talked a little about updating and software update cycles and how that's done. Once again, where consumer devices are just constantly updating. And is that going to be a shift once again, moving to some of these new architectures, some of these new platforms, the way automotive software is being done for the new compute platforms on wheels? That's an interesting question. So certainly there's a demand for a higher frequency of updates and there's also a proof by new players that this is possible especially on heavily centralized architectures. But we have to look onto what kind of updates are delivered. So it's certainly very easy to uh, offer something like a fart mode or so, a uh, feature that puts a smile on your customer's face, but it's not safety critical, uh, it's a gimmick, and this is certainly possible. And we should certainly make sure that we have at least part of our tech stack where such an update is easily possible and much faster than in the past. Mm -hmm. That can either be on the infotainment system or on an STV edge stack, something like that. But on the other hand, if we look at what kind of functions are OEMs and we as tier ones at Bosch actually investing into, mm -hmm. how much of this investment is really this kind of application, like a user gimmick, and how much is this compared to what we're actually investing into? Right. And then we see uh, a lot of the investments go really into hardcore vehicle functions that influence the actual movement of the vehicle on the street. So it's safety critical, it's highly dynamic. It's amazing how sensitive customers are for really microsecond behavior in their vehicle dynamics. Really? Interesting. You really feel whether you have a great application of your vehicle and everything just fits, everything works nicely together versus a vehicle that is just mm -hmm. the default configuration and a little bit on top. So a lot of these functions are actually doing something concerning vehicle dynamics, concerning safety, concerning uh, the actual physical world. And to offer a user-managed individual update mechanism is a much harder problem than we think. So I think there's a class of functions where making an easy update process, high frequency update, even user triggered is easy. And there's a part of the vehicle where we talk about uh, actual functions that interact, where the OEM is still responsible to in every configuration you deem possible in a set of updates, they need to deliver onto the responsibility that the vehicle is always in a safe state, no matter what updates or combination of updates is right. uh, provided. And I think it could be at least two lanes. So one part of the vehicle that contains all the safety critical functions, right. and they are released together, like in a platform release, mm -hmm. where this is managed by the OEM, they do all the testing before they send it to the fleet and they do all the tests and combinations of each other where we say, hey, this version 1.3 of the base platform, if they upload this to the vehicle, I certify this as safe. Right. And then you have maybe another part of the vehicle tech stack where you allow much more independent updates, user triggered. This can be infotainment, this can be an STV stack where you say, 
the base platform is sufficiently separated from that domain of the vehicle, you make a good safety case why this will be the case under all conditions, and then you can allow much more dynamic update behavior on that partition. And I think for a really good end-to-end -end customer experience, you need to supply both. Just bringing these fast platforms to the vehicle is not enough. You need a combination of how can the OEM keep up with the responsibility of always uh, guaranteeing a safe operation on the road in combination with higher update rates on these new or dynamic platforms. Yeah, like you said, there are the features that make people happy, and these are more of a consumer type of feature or add-on, as opposed to the underlying making sure that the car is safe, that it continues to operate in a reliable manner, which the consumer either isn't aware of, doesn't care about, or just takes for granted. <laughs> that that part of it is going to work. Yes. And they're adding, hey, my new app just updated. And so like you say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, you know, doing it in two different levels where one is more features and non-critical where one is you've got to do this or else. So I can give you one concrete example. One is your battery management. Okay. So you have a part of the function that is written in classical embedded style, high safety manner that always assures that your battery cannot overheat and that you keep it in the bounds of safe physical parameters and so on. And in the classical development mode, you would have a battery controller where these features are allocated and also all the other features like how do I communicate to the charging station? How do I communicate with maybe the backend network of the charging provider? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't need to be the case. All you need to offer in the base platform is make sure that the battery cannot be damaged. Right. Then you have maybe have an STV stack that is much more easily capable to keep pace with all the innovation and ecosystem momentum that is happening. There are new standards, charging providers, new alliances, uh, new protocols to speak over the wire. You can allocate this function on a much more dynamically easier updatable stack and these functions communicate with the safety critical functions that actually then control the battery. Okay. And I think we are going to see much more of these combinations where you combine the best of both worlds. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, the overall charging of the battery or maintaining the battery changes a little bit, but it really doesn't change over time as often as, like you said, the ecosystem, the alliances, the availability of chargers, especially as you start tying into the grid and being able to know when to charge, all that changes very dynamically. Now, we've talked a lot about the challenges in moving from the current domain-based, MCU-based platform uh, architectures to some of these newer, either a centralized, a zonal, or, or something like that. What's that going to be like on a cultural level between, you mentioned that you've got the culture of the data center over here versus the culture of the automotive industry over here. Are those two cultures, once again, not necessarily the companies themselves, but the, are the cultures going to merge eventually? Or is it still going to be kind of the automotive culture separate from a data center type of culture? That's a good question. So I think the first thing that needs to happen, and it has already happened to some extent, is the classical microcontroller experts had concerns which were actually not fulfilled by the new kind of architectural patterns that came to the vehicle with regard to guaranteed latency, jitter, low jitter, and so on, under all conditions. And there's a lot of stuff, for example, for the zonal architectures with time-sensitive networking, the new Ethernet standards, where you can actually offer these kind of features for the backbone that connects the zones to each other. So you can offer mm -hmm. highly safeguarded, fast communication paths, lanes for important latency critical functions and so on. And this hasn't been there so far. And it was very easy to have like a lot of companies got like a IT guy to lead now an automotive organization, IT game came in and says, oh, well, this is all, it should be much easier. And uh, you just didn't get the memo, you are like old school and stuff. <laughs> and this crashed because they had very legitimate concerns, which weren't fulfilled by the new solutions and they didn't speak the same language. And so one technical part to improve this is that the new systems actually give you that features. And only then can the cultural adaptation start because you actually have a base architecture where you can start solving problems together. And I right. think if you enable people also from different cultures to solve problems together, it gets much easier to come to a cultural journey that combines the best of both worlds. And I think we're closer to that than we have ever been so far. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. 
And one technology that has come up over and over while doing these podcasts is the technology of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And clearly there's going to be a lot of that in automobiles moving forward between autonomy, between driver safety. On the software side, how is that being integrated into the car to maintain those safety critical systems and maintain the level of safety that is required? That's a good question. So one thing is what's for sure we cannot deploy these workloads on microcontrollers. They are too compute intensive. We need other right. kind of architectures, GPUs and dedicated accelerators make much more sense. Yep, absolutely. And but on the other hand, these architectures come from the data center where they are optimized for batch processing and they are often not optimized for latency critical stuff. And so this is the first technical challenge that we need to solve. There has been some development in the sense of that it wasn't possible like two years ago that you could interrupt a long running GPU task with something safety critical where you say, hey, so everything you do, you need to execute that. There was just no API for that. Really? And stuff like this has been improving. It's not fully in the target zone yet, but stuff is improving. And we see more and more use cases where we can actually deploy moderate safety payloads, like SLB kind of stuff on accelerators and GPUs with further developed architectures. But it remains a challenge. So I think we're never going to see in a microcontroller environment where we could super mission critical SLD kind of stuff. We deploy on hardware, software co-designed microcontroller and it really is a cornerstone of our safety case. There's just too much code and runtime optimization involved that I expect this in the next five years on GPUs. So we probably have combinations. You have some uh, moderate safety QM or SLB or A. Then you have maybe some diversity, different variants. And a combination of that with a microcontroller or stuff that runs on a CPU in combination uh, creates a safe systems. But this is still evolving and a very interesting topic. Yeah, absolutely. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, I mean, they're going to affect almost anything, every technology out there, but none more so than the autonomous driving capabilities of some of the new cars. Yes. There's also an interesting angle. Our GPUs are a good host or accelerators for a new class of functions, like a more powerful perception of the outside environment and so on. There's a good match between what these technologies offer and what we need. On the other hand, I see a lot of experimentation, actually, in the sense of you have some simple Linux Edge stack and customers are deploying ML-based experiments, very simple trigger functions where they monitor some stuff in the vehicle, they run an experiment, they have some hypothesis, what could be correlated and so on, what could they use to predict. And if you make it very easy to deploy ML functions to the vehicle and make that really easily updatable, there's a lot of creativity at OEMs to just try stuff. This is not really a function that you sell a user, but constantly happening experiments and OEMs seem to pull a lot of value out of that. Oh, interesting. I, I didn't realize that sort of work was ongoing, I mean, already in vehicles. Well, Christian, I want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your insight into the automotive, the software side of the automotive world. As an old hardware guy, I've learned a lot and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. So uh, I also really enjoyed it. And that's it, folks. An in-depth exploration of Zodal architecture and the future of the software-defined vehicle. Christian, we're so happy you were able to join us for this discussion. Thank you for being our guest on The Tech Between Us. If you're looking for even more content on the newest technologies and solutions, visit mauser.com slash empowering-innovation.